Good morning and uh, welcome. And if you would please turn with me to the 18th chapter of Luke. Luke 18, reading verse 1. This is the word of the Lord. And he told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. So let us pray. Our Father, we thank you for the word. Thank you for all the things that we've sung about this morning. We pray that you will build into us the faith that will not be shaken, that you will cause us to hear you speak, and that you will cause us to obey all of these wonderful things we have uh, sung, and now we ask for them to be the reality in our life. Thank you for the word. Thank you for your many blessings. Lord, we take for granted so much of what you do. We feel that we do the things that bring us uh, whatever we call success. And yet your word reminds us, what do you have that you did not receive? Every, every breath that we breathe is a gift from you. Every talent that we use to create an income for our families is a gift from you. Every uh, step that we take is a gift from you, and we thank you. We are so remiss. And then, Lord, there are those hard things. Think of all of those who are affected by the damage from the hail this week uh, to the southeast of us here. And, Lord, we just, hearts go out to those who lost crops and lost income, to those who lost jobs that they would have had had there been a harvest. And uh, so, Lord, our, our, uh, this is a time when our faith is tested and really it's not real if it's not tested. And so we pray that you will help us even in these things and in these times to reflect glory to you by showing our confidence in you, by demonstrating our faith. Lord, that's not easy, and we know that you know that, and we thank you that you account for that, that you give us words of encouragement in your word. And as we come to some of those this morning, we pray that you will enlighten us and that you will send us away a little differently than we came. And we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. It's one single verse that we've read this morning, but there is a context, as always. And uh, so we always want to be aware of the context. And you will recall that we've just been studying how the Lord is correcting the disciples' impressions about the coming kingdom. He has known that they have expectations that are not going to be met. They believe they're on the way to Jerusalem to essentially create a kingdom of God that God has, has called for in the Old Testament, and they think it's going to come right now. Luke 19, 11 reminds us that the, the, that the disciples believed that the kingdom would come immediately. This was their expectation. Well, it's not going to be that way. And so Jesus, first of all, kind of gives them some words at the end of chapter 17 to to enlighten them with regard to what is going to happen. And you recall that in the beginning of verse 20, he begins to tell them that the kingdom is multidimensional, that it has both a spiritual and a physical entity to it, that the spiritual, in fact, has come with him, that it will be initiated at his death and resurrection and ascension to the Father as he takes up residence in the hearts of all of those who believe in him. So the rule of God within is the spiritual kingdom. That's why Jesus could say, my kingdom is not of this world, and indeed the spiritual element of it is not. So they needed to understand that. But beginning in verse 22 of chapter 17, the Lord does remind them that there is a consummation or a culmination to the kingdom that is yet to come, physical, political. It's just not going to come when they think. And so he teaches them about that. He teaches them that that part, the consummation of the kingdom, is delayed. It's delayed by the rejection of the nation of Israel, of their Messiah, of their king. They have turned him down because they don't like the message of repentance. He has demonstrated himself in every way that would be possible with his preaching and with his teaching and with his miracles. And yet they have rejected him, and so the kingdom is delayed. Rejection will result from this, a rejection uh, will result in the, in the delay of this kingdom. Well, delay 
is a bitter pill to swallow, is it not? Delay is always a bitter pill to swallow. You have an expectation and suddenly it's not going to be met. And so you feel bad about that. And in this case, it's worse than that. The delay is going to be accompanied by persecution. It's going to be accompanied by martyrdom. I mean, they're expecting to be, you know, the Secretary of State and the Secretary of Finance and whatever, and instead they're going to face persecution and martyrdom and everything else. Reality is going to intrude drastically on their expectations. And so knowing this and knowing how tough it will be, Jesus takes some time now to give them a parable and to give them some teaching on how to live in light of that unmet expectation with regard to the timing of the kingdom. And his basic instruction is right there in verse 1. They ought always to pray and not to lose heart in light of an ex unmet expectation, in light of something that's going to be drastically different than they think, his advice is keep the faith. Don't lose heart. Pray. Keep praying. Keep believing. That's what he's challenging them and us. And then in verse 8, at the culmination of this brief section, he challenges them and us with a very specific and challenging question. Notice verse 8, as you drop down to it, he says, Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? So the kingdom is delayed. It's going to be associated with the second coming that the disciples couldn't even begin to anticipate at that point in time. But he says, when that finally does happen, am I going to find any faith left at all? In fact, the literal translation of what he says there is, will I find that faith on earth? That faith. What faith? The faith that will not be shaken, as we sang about this morning. The faith that will take whatever comes as being from God. The faith that believes not in the results, but that believes in God. The faith that is not insisting on its own timing, on its own expectations, but is trusting in God. The faith that understands that delay does not mean cancellation the faith that does not waver in the face of whatever comes our way. That faith. Will he find that faith? Does he find that faith in us? That's the question that he's asking. The delay, as Jesus knows, is going to be long in human terms, 2,000 years already and counting. Meantime, the disciples are going to face, as we are, a, 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 an increasingly hostile world, a wicked world, an evil world. It will not look like he's coming. It will look like a charade. Not only where they'll be, will they be, be evil in the world, it seems to overcome everything, but they will be people who will laugh at the very idea of a faith that says, no, he's coming again. They will mock. They will make fun. And yet... Can you overcome in the midst of this kind of challenging faith? Can you be unflinching in your faith in God in the midst of all of this? Jesus wants to help them as he wants to help us learn to live with the tension of a kingdom that is already Jesus rule in our hearts and yet not yet, not yet ruling in the world as he will one day. So how do we live a kingdom lifestyle in a kingdomless world? That's the question. Or another way to put it, how do we live a faithful life in a faithless world so that when he comes, he will find that faith? That is what this passage is about. Now, verse 1 He's going to give us the two basic instructions that Jesus wants us to give. One negative, one positive. The first one, and we'll take the, the, the last one first. He says, I don't want you to lose heart. If Jesus is to find that faith when he comes again, we must not lose heart. Living a kingdom lifestyle in a kingdomless world is not going to be easy. It's going to require a lot of faith. It's going to require that we believe when it doesn't look like there's any reason to believe. 
It's gonna require that we trust what God says instead of what we see with our eyes. That is not easy. And Jesus knows that, but he says in the midst of that, I don't want you to lose heart. He knows that this kind of faith has to come from within. You're not gonna get any encouragement to live this way from the outside. From the outside, you're gonna get pragmatism. From the outside, you're gonna get human wisdom. And we see our society going down that path rapidly. So he's saying this is gonna have to be something that comes from inside. This is your heart. Don't lose heart. Keep on believing. Have a tenacious faith. In spite of what you may see, that's what he's encouraging. Now why do people lose heart? Turn with me to Deuteronomy 1 because this may help us understand how it is that we can maintain a heart that has a faith in God and a trust in God that is absolutely without fail. In Deuteronomy 1, Moses is giving his last sermon to the children of Israel before he dies. He reminds them that 40 years earlier, God had instructed him to come and to be the instrument through whom they were released from captivity in Egypt. And so Moses had followed that. He had come. They had been released from, from captivity in Egypt through a series of absolutely miraculous, spectacular events. And yet they had grumbled and complained so much when they finally got out that God finally said, okay, this generation is going to have to die off before you go into the land. I'm not going to give you this promise. You treat my goodness in that way. And so there was a lesson there. And for 40 years, they wandered around in the wilderness. But now they're at the end of that time. It's time to go into the land. The old generation has died off. And so Moses wants to give them some instruction. And the first thing he does is he sends some spies into the land to spy it out, see what it's like. And the spies return with great news. It's good news and there's bad news. The good news is this land flows with milk and honey. That may not sound that great to some of you, but the idea is this is a very fertile land. It's a wonderful place. We can grow anything we want to here. We want this place. The bad news is there are some very fearsome people living there. There are giants of epic proportion. We look like grasshoppers in their sight. So 10 of the 12 spies who went into the land said, we can't go. We're not going to be able to take this land. Two of them, Caleb and Joshua, said, let's go. God made the promise. It may look like it can't happen, but we believe God. So what did the people do? Well, Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 27. And you murmured in your tents. And you said, because the Lord hated us. The Lord hated us? He brought us out of captivity in Egypt and they're saying you hated us? Because the Lord hated us, he has brought us out of the land of Egypt to give us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us. Where are we going up? Our brothers have made our hearts melt, saying the people are greater and taller than we, the cities are great and fortified up to the heavens. Moses urged him to go, they wouldn't go. And so there were 40, it was 40 years of going absolutely nowhere, just wandering around in a circle in the Sinai desert. What caused the loss of heart? What caused the melting hearts? Beloved, this is really simple. We talk about it and we think about it often and yet every time it comes up, we do the same thing. What caused the melting hearts of these people? Looking at the problem instead of the solution. Looking at the circumstances instead of trusting in God. Putting their faith in what their eyes could see rather than in what God had promised. And that can happen in a thousand different ways. Discouragement hits us. Disease, persecution, Hail that wipes the crops out. I don't know what the problem is. There's a problems all around. The thought of being mocked, thought of being thought not very smart by the elite of our culture. In some cases, even the thought that our lives are, are being 
are being threatened in many parts of the world. All of these can bring discouragement, right? All of these can cause us to look at the problem and get focused on the problem. Discouragement comes. Watching a culture being just first gradually and now even very rapidly turning away from the biblical values that it's had for lots of years. It's discouraging, isn't it? And yet we can get focused on the problem and make the problem be so intimidating that we miss the God who is so much bigger than the problem. The God who is in control and always has been in control and always will be in control. That's what caused melting hearts. That's what causes us to lose heart is when our focus is misplaced. When our focus is on the problem instead of our focus being on the solution. When that happens, life becomes discouraging. God seems small and people and circumstances and other things seem big. Things that seem impossible to us are nothing to God and yet to us that becomes the, tr the untruth that drives our lives. The idea that God somehow has lost control. The idea that God is maybe not omniscient like I thought he was. The, God, the, God, the idea that God doesn't care. He cares about others, but he doesn't care about me. Those kind of untruths, those kind of doubts begin to drive our life. Delay in the type of answer we want or in the timing that we want it. We've all been there. You've been there. I've been there. We pray for something and it, and it doesn't happen. It doesn't come when we need it. It doesn't come when we think we need it. It doesn't come in the way that we think we need it and so we lose faith because our faith is in the result that we're looking for, not in the God who can provide the result. We need to be like the guy who went to the doctor, you know, and said to the doctor, Doc, I, I broke my leg in two places. Can you, can you help me? And the doc said, yeah, stay away from those places. I mean, you know, if you're going to go somewhere and break your leg, get out of there. That's what Jesus is saying here. Stop being buried under the circumstances. You're looking in the wrong place. Don't lose heart. Trust in God. So the kingdom's not coming when you thought it was going to. It's not be, being consummated in the way you thought it was. Trust in God. Don't lose faith. Don't lose heart. Realize that with, when you're getting that kind of doubt in your life, there's one thing you know. You're wrong and God is right. So keep believing, keep trusting, so that when he does come, he will find that faith. Don't lose heart. Well, then the second thing is what? The second instruction he gives us is, verse one again, he told them a parable to the effect that they had always to pray. Literally, the verse reads, it is necessary that they pray. It's a Greek word, little Greek word day. It's, it's, it's an intense word. It means it's, this is something that's absolutely necessary. It's necessary you pray. So when tough times come, how do we keep from losing heart? Pray. Always pray, he says. Always pray. When things look bleak, pray. When things look impossible, pray. When things are going good, Pray more, because you need it more when things are going good, because that's when you don't pray. Pray, always pray. That's the instruction of the Lord. Prayer is the expression. Look at it this way, beloved. Prayer is the expression of that faith. Prayer is how we are in communication with God. Prayer is how we move toward God. You know, we, we kind of have this concept that prayer is moving God toward us. Prayer is never about moving God toward us. Prayer is about moving us toward God. Learning to trust Him, learning to depend on Him, learning to believe in Him regardless of whatever, whatever is happening. Don't give up. Jesus is saying it may be a while and the conditions may be tough in the meantime, but don't lose heart. Pray. Now we might ask in this case, what should we pray for? For what do we pray? Well, in this context, the answer to that question is really easy. Pray for the kingdom. Pray for the kingdom. 
What were they looking for? What did they want? What had God promised all the way through the Old Testament? The consummation of the kingdom. What's being delayed? The kingdom. So what do you do about it? Pray for it. Pray for the kingdom of God. The kingdom is on hold, but it's not canceled. So as those who want to see God vindicated in the world, as those who want to see an end to evil, as those who want to see things made right that are wrong, that want to see the injustices of life be turned into justness, into fairness, as those who want to see God's name lifted up instead of, instead, instead of you know, trodden down in the mud of our society, as those who want to see God's character revered, pray for the kingdom of God. Let's admit it, we're not very good at that, right? We pray for the kingdom of me a lot. I have my own personal concerns. Do you have concerns for the kingdom of God? Do you pray for the kingdom of God? How do you, so how do you, how do you know they should pray for the kingdom? Well, it's in, what's, what's in the Lord's prayer? The model prayer that he gave us, that he told us how to pray. What is it? Our Father who art in heaven, what? Hallowed be your name, and then what? Your kingdom come. It's right there. It's one of six requests in their prayer. So, think it's important? It's the second one right after your name be hallowed, your kingdom come. Have you prayed for that lately? I mean, you know, on your... Think back in the last week, in the last month. Go back the last year. Have you prayed for that more than half a dozen times? Have you prayed for it that many times? Is it on your lips, your kingdom come? I mean, just make it that simple. We can pray in more detail for his kingdom to come. Could you help us with this? Could you help us with that? The things that we're doing in ministry, those are all ways that we could pray for the kingdom to come. But why not just use the words, Lord, let your kingdom come. Come back. Isn't that what John prayed at the end of Revelation? Lord, even so, come quickly. This is to be at the heart of a true believer. Your kingdom come. Let your kingdom come. See, we are so sinfully distracted with our own concerns that we forget about the concerns of God. We long for this world a lot more than we long for his kingdom to come. You know, there's another request in that prayer right after that one, what is, which is what? Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What is that except the kingdom of God? So now you got two requests out of six that relate to God's will being done on earth instead of man's will being done on earth. One third of the Lord's prayer is basically for the kingdom to come. Is it on your heart that way? This is to be the heartbeat of a true believer. I, you know, I, I, I will confess this here and now. It gets easier as you get older, as you see more of life, as you understand that the things that you thought were gonna be important to you and that you love and that you think will bring you satisfaction inevitably let you down. And as you get old enough to realize, you know, 20 years from now, I don't have plans because I'm probably not gonna be here. I'm being glory. The kingdom of God becomes more important. But listen, if, it, if it's going to be important when you're 60 or 70, why shouldn't it be important when you're 20 or 30? That's the age the guys Jesus was talking to were. Let your kingdom come. Let that become the, the cry of your heart. True believers, that faith is the faith that wants to see Jesus' kingdom come here and now. I think, I, th I think because it's been delayed and because it's now 2,000 years, you know, there's this tendency to think, oh, I'm never going to see it in my lifetime. So why worry about it? I just got to worry about getting through tomorrow. And Jesus is saying, no, worry about the kingdom coming. Pray for the kingdom to come. It could be tomorrow. Pray for the kingdom to come. Pray for his will to be done. J.I. Packer says this, he says, the goal of the kingdom is the actual eliminating of all active opposition to God's will. Wouldn't you like that? 
The goal of the kingdom is the actual eliminating of all active opposition to God's will and all disharmony caused by sin, as well as the salvation of God's people. You know, if that's what occupies God's mind night and day, shouldn't it be what occupies ours as well? Shouldn't we be praying for it and longing for it and desiring it and wanting it enough to make it a part of our existence? Listen, I, I grant you, at the end of the day, nothing can prevent the coming of the kingdom of God. But beloved, I believe this to my heart, our prayers can hasten the coming of the kingdom of God. That's why he asked us to pray for it. How great is it to be privileged to pray for something that we know is absolutely in the will of God? Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Someone asked the great uh, missionary David Livingston one time, what is it that sustains you? You know, you're out there in the middle of all this chaos. You don't know the culture. You're facing all kinds of difficulties. You don't have any of the, of the niceties that we have back here in cultured society. What sustains you? Here's what he said. I'll tell you what sustains me. It's the instruction from Jesus that said, go, go therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Jesus is ruling in our hearts, beloved. Don't we want him to be ruling in Washington, D.C.? And in Jerusalem where the nations can come to him. Don't we want that? Livingston, when his wife died in Africa, he made the coffin. He wanted anybody else to do it. He helped lower it into the ground. And then he read the Great Commission once again that we just read. And he said, these are the words of a gentleman of the strictest and most sacred honor. And he will keep his word. Let us get on with the task. He said, I know I'm, play I'm praying in the will of God. He's with me. He promised he'd be with me. He's promised that he's coming again. It's the word of a gentleman. Pray for his kingdom to come. Now, does that mean we don't pray for these other things that we always pray for? Of course not. I mean, I hope you're praying for these other things, these, these needs that you have. What's one of the next phrases in the Lord's Prayer? Isn't it, give us this day our daily bread, right? Which, by the way, is the only prayer for physical, personal needs in that prayer. You kind of get the idea of what, where it fits in the scheme of things. But yes, God is interested in that. He instructs us to pray for our daily bread, for our daily needs, I take it. Our daily concerns are his daily concerns. But see, prayer has a context, and the context is God's kingdom. The context is God's kingdom. If, if God is concerned, if God's if our daily concerns are God's daily concerns, then, beloved, his long-term concerns need to be our long-term concerns, right? We must integrate his kingdom into our daily concerns. We're already citizens of the kingdom, he's told us. Listen, it's, it's important to most of us that we're citizens of the United States, appropriately so, but there's something that's far more important if you're a, if you're a Christian, and that is that you're a citizen of heaven. You're already a part of the kingdom of God. So why wouldn't you pray for it to come? Our prayers are usually very now focused on us and our needs. They need to be more focused on praying for what God wants and for what God desires rather than praying so selfishly. Turn with me to Jonah 2. One of the great prayers of the Bible is in Jonah 2. You would kind of expect a great prayer from a guy that has run from God, right? Been told, I want you to go preach over here. And it's like God, you know, he's in Los Angeles and God tells him, I want you to go preach in Chicago. And so he finds the first ship to Indonesia. That's Jonah. And of course, on the way, God sends this storm and he ends up in the belly of this great fish. That's a good time to pray, right? And Jonah did. Now, let me ask you, if you were in the belly of that fish, through your own foolishness, how would you be praying? 
I know what I'd be praying. Lord, forgive me. I get it. I was wrong. You were right. I'm willing to go. Just, you just get me out of here. I'll do whatever you ask. There's not a single request in Jonah's prayer. Not one. Jonah 2, verse 7. When my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord. And my prayer came to you into your holy temple. I love this. Because what Jonah is saying is what I thought was so important, what was number one on my list, and we'll look at what it was in just a moment, but what I thought was so important, I see isn't important at all. It's you that are important. It's you that I need to be before. I remembered the Lord. It's a marvelous prayer. He's had an epiphany. God is in charge. It's easy to get an epiphany like that when you're in the belly of a whale, right? God's in charge. He's been intent on his own way, but now I remember the Lord. That's our challenge. Don't forget the Lord. Don't get focused on the problem and forget the Lord. Save yourself a lot of trouble. Keep his person, his agenda, his plans foremost in your mind. Look at verse 8. Those who, those, who pay re, the, those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. That's an interesting verse because it operates on multiple levels in this passage. It operates, first of all, in the life of Jonah. Steadfast love, by the way, is, it's a Hebrew word, chesed, chesed, which can be translated grace or love or unmerited favor. God's mercy. What Jonah is saying, when I chase idols, guess what I do? God's love doesn't stop, but I remove myself from it. You want to do that? Really? And see, Jonah's recognizing that it wasn't just the people in Nineveh that had idols. Jonah had idols. What was Jonah's idol? Nationalism. He loved Israel. He hated the Ninevites. He had good reason to hate the Ninevites. The Assyrians were some of the most cruel people in history. Let's give you one quick example. I don't want to get too graphic. Well, this will be graphic. But the Assyrians, when they came in to capture a place, they took the leaders of the place after they conquered the city. They'd take them out and they would basically skin them alive and keep them alive for as long as many days as they could so that the people could see this is what happens to you if you, if you disobey us. Man, they were brutal, cruel people. That's just, that's just a start of what they did. Jonah hated them. He hated them for good reason. But it was an idol. And it was an idol that was removing him from the everlasting love of God. And now he's recognized that. At another level, that statement was operating for the Ninevites, right? They had their idols. Their idols had removed them from the everlasting love of God. And now God wants Jonah to be the instrument to go and tell them the gospel and the good news that they can repent. They can get rid of the idols and they can serve the true and living God. Jonah has no hope that they would do that. In fact, Jonah's hope is that they never would do that because he wants to see him killed. He would feel about them the way probably we would feel about ISIS today, right? Deep in our hearts, what do we want? Kill them. But it's their idols that have removed them from the everlasting love of God, just like it's the idols of Nineveh that have removed them from the everlasting love of God. And God wants to send at least the message so that the people have a chance. Because see, God is not just the God of Israel. God is the God of everybody. Do we pray like that? I mean, do you ever go through your life and say, what is my idol? What is it that I can't live without? What is it that I can't put away? What is it that I won't put away? What is it that I hang on to? What is it that's removing me from the everlasting love of God? What is it that keeps me from loving his kingdom? Because frankly, if Jesus came, then I wouldn't be able to do this or I wouldn't be able to have that or I wouldn't be able to whatever the thing is. 
We all have idols, beloved. We all do, even as Christians. We keep a little shrine somewhere in our hearts and we have to, 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 we have to just get brutal with the idols in our lives. I'll tell you this, you chase your own ambition, you chase the thing that you think you love most outside of Christ, and I'll promise you one thing, it'll destroy you. Idols promise everything and then they destroy you. They do. You gotta find the idols. You gotta root them out. It's a guaranteed way to get no answers to your prayers and that is to pray selfishly. God warns against that. James 4, verse 3. Remember what he says there? God says, you ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. In other words, you care about what you care about more than you care about what I care about. When you're praying for the kingdom of God, at least you know you're praying for what God cares about. You need to be praying for the kingdom of God. It changes your whole attitude and your whole perspective on life. And you'll be one who has that faith when Jesus comes again. That's why in Jonah, Jonah closes his prayer by saying this. He says in verse nine, but I with the voice of thanksgiving will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. He's recognized the thing that's really important is salvation. I've got that. It belongs to the Lord. And he's recognizing physical salvation, whether I get out of the belly of this fish or whether I don't, that's in the hands of the Lord. It's really immaterial because my spiritual salvation is assured. Salvation is of the Lord. He is the one who's in charge. I thought I could escape. I thought I could go my own way. I thought I could do my own thing. God was in charge the whole time. God is always in charge. God is never not in charge. Whatever it may look like, however bad it may look, pray for the kingdom. So how do we pray for the kingdom in practice? I mean, let's just get really practical, okay? So I don't know. You gotta get a new car. You gotta get a new car. So how do you pray? God, help me find a new car. Help me find a new car that will help me do the best that I can to forward the things you want done. You know, I got to get from A to B. I got to work. I got to support my family. I don't know what else you want me to do with this car, but give me, help me to find the best car that's going to be good for what you want. Got a disease. They, they told me cancer. What do I pray for? I pray for the answer that will most reflect God's glory. Pray for the kingdom of God. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus, because he put that at the beginning of his model prayer, is inviting us to make every request in light of the kingdom of God. That's what he wants us to do. That's to be our perspective so that we're praying for God's kingdom to come, not our own. We're praying for the things that will enhance God's reputation. God's name on earth, not our own. <coughs> Let me close with this. This is, this is easy to, it's easy to have faith in theory, right? I mean, we all, if I went around the room, you have faith, yeah, believe in God, believe in God, believe in God, believe in God. Then I, I don't think anybody would say, no, I don't believe in God. It's when the trial comes that we find out if we have that faith, right? C.S. Lewis was arguably the greatest apologist for the Christian faith in the 20th century. There were some other great ones. I don't think any had more influence than C.S. Lewis. Teaching in that <laughs> hotbed of great theology in Oxford and then a little bit at Cambridge toward the end of his life where, where all he got really was mocked for his faith. He upheld the truth of Scripture and the truth that Jesus was God and the truth that you have to come in faith to him, he was, and he did it in ways that could appeal to those who were the smartest among us because he was one of the smartest among us, right? God gave him a mind that he could use. His thoughtful writings and explanations of the Christian faith had a tremendous influence. He was greatly used by God. But then came his own trial. Then came his own trial. And he fainted for a while. 
the great Sewis Lewis fainted for a while. He didn't marry until late in life. And he met a woman named Joy Davidson. Some of you have seen this story in the film Shadowlands or maybe even read the book uh, about this. But he married this lady named Joy Davidson. She was an American who had recently been divorced from an abusive husband. Originally, it was, uh, you know, their minds, he was smart, he was smart, their minds just melded. And, and originally, it was a marriage of convenience just so she could stay in England but it became a true union of loving hearts. But they were married only a short time when she was diagnosed with cancer. They prayed about it. There was remission for a brief period of time and they thought, great, our prayers are answered. And then within three short years of the time they got married, she was gone. And Lewis' faith took a hit like he never believed it could take. His faith, which had passed every intellectual test that there is, (laughs) did not pass originally the experiential test. He describes it in his book, A Grief Observed. Intense, paralyzing grief overcame him. Every element of his faith was profoundly challenged. He said, what chokes every prayer and every hope is the memory of all the prayers we offered and all the false hope that we had. I'm guessing there's a lot of us here today that can relate to that, right? Prayer wasn't answered the way you thought it should be. It wasn't answered in the time that you thought it should be. It's it's easy to have hope fail at that time. In the end for Lewis, the, the experience strengthened his faith but it's only, only as a result of the realization that he and Joy had not been praying in submission to God, but that their praying had been telling God what to do. He said he went back over notes that he had made during his darkest hours. And he came to this telling observation. He said, these notes have been about myself and about Joy and about God in that order. In that order. And he said, the order and the proportions are exactly what they ought not to have been. Lewis discovered, beloved, as we all must, it's not about my kingdom. It's not about your kingdom. It's not about your family's kingdom. It's about the kingdom of God. So don't lose heart, but pray. Always pray. And always pray for the kingdom and the will of God. Faithful life in a faithless world will require that because we will all be tested different ways, different times, sometimes severely. And if our faith is going to be that faith, it's going to have to be dependent on us not losing heart and upon us praying faithfully. Let's pray together now. Lord, we thank you for this um, instruction. We'll see how you demonstrate it for us next week with this wonderful parable. But as we've just considered the pure instruction, it's, it's an encouragement to us, it's a reminder to us that all things are under your control. You have never for one moment lost control at all. It just didn't happen to be what we wanted. It just didn't happen to be when we wanted it. And so, Father, help us to have submissive hearts, not melting hearts, not hearts that are failing, but truly submissive hearts that are therefore strong in you. So that when you come, you will find that faith. And in fact, that in our lives, until the moment you do come, you will find that faith. Encourage our hearts because you are our loving God, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.